encompassing the needs of all roadway users while maintaining a culture of safety is, cha is challenging, but not impossible. In tonight's presentation, Mr. Neighbor will share how transportation engineers identify safety issues, balance multimodal needs, and consider data and context when identifying the appropriate solutions. He'll then share with you tools from the engineering toolbox to address safety from quick build to long-term strategies. Dan is the Bureau Chief for, for the Transportation Engineering and Operations Bureau in Arlington County, Virginia, where he leads the county's signals, signals design, operations, streetlight, and Vision Zero programs. Dan started his career as a commissioned officer in the United States Army Corps of Engineers before working in the private sector as a manager and transportation engineer. There, he led teams on a variety of projects focusing on finding innovative solutions to integrate pedestrians, bicyclists, vehicles, and transit. Due to the nature of his projects, Dan has been engaged in working with a diverse set of stakeholders and the public and has been highly successful in finding common ground to implement improvements. Now, some housekeeping items. We've got soft drinks and other refreshments um, in the back by the door, far back. Um, restrooms are out the back, to your right, and on the right. Um, if you did not sign in, please do sign in before you leave. Sign in forms are on the back table where Amy's sitting. Evaluation forms are on your tables. Please fill one out. Leave it in the basket by the table, um, on the table by the door where Amy's sitting. Um, watch for emails and the Compass website for information on future presentations. Tonight's presentation is being taped um, and will be available later on, on Compass's YouTube channel. Tonight's slides will also be posted on Compass's website. Also, to avoid that awkward moment of an unfortunate ringtone, please silence your um, cell phones um, and join me in welcoming Dan Neighbor. All right, good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing? Well, I'm probably used to this 100 degree weather. <laughs> I'm not yet, but I'm glad to be here. So, you know, thank you for, to Amy, thank you, Matt, for the introduction. Thank you, Amy, for helping to organize, and thank you, Hunter, as well. We have a lot of things to go over today and tomorrow. Uh, this is meant to be interactive so that, you know, everybody learns and we learn from each other. So, this isn't just, you know, me speaking up here. So, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand. And let's discuss uh, some of these exciting things with uh, um, transportation safety tonight. Everybody ready? Okay, let's go. All right, so I'm um, going to start off with some introductions in terms of what um, uh, Vision Zero means, just where I'm coming from, and how you balance the, the multimodal needs. Um, I'm going to talk over the safety toolbox. These are the tools that we typically use to help improve safety. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, how you identify a safety issue uh, because really what we want to direct people to do is like understanding the issue so you come up with the right solution. And then we'll talk about um, different uh, ways that we put safety measures into action. Um, and then of course we'll wrap up and have more discussion if there's time. So, all right, so I've already been introduced. This is my email if you want to contact me if you have any questions following our um, presentation this evening. And really quick on Arlington County, just so you know a little bit about Arlington, you can see up here, um, we have a, a graphic. Does this have a pointer? Maybe not. Nope. Um, but you can see where Arlington, Virginia is right outside of DC. We're a community of about uh, 240,000 people, um, 121, Thousand housing units, 214,000 jobs. So even though you know we have this um, quarter of a million population, during the day that goes up to half a million because you know, we have well, we have the Pentagon in there, which is a big uh, uh, employer. We have uh, headquarters too for Amazon. There's a lot of other companies that have their headquarters there as well. So we have a lot of people commuting into Arlington, um, and the land area is about 26 square miles. So in 2019, we adopted our uh, Vision Zero um, 
board, or the county board um, adopted an ordinance for committing us to doing a Vision Zero Action Plan. And in May of 2021, we finalized that five-year action plan. Now, in that action plan, our goal is to have zero uh, fatalities or serious injuries by 2030. But we give us gives us the flexibility in between, you know, the time that we started our first plan to the time that we want to reach our goals to have a, a you know, a plan adjustment. Because part of the success we see in Vision Zero is having real-time data, real-time analysis to really determine if we're on the right path, right? If we, you know, think we're on the wrong path in 2028, um, it's almost too late for us to reach our goals by 2030. And again, what we say is that we want to reach these the goals of, of zero fatalities or serious injuries by 2030, but ideally we can do it before then. So what is Vision Zero? Um, you can see here uh, there's two different approaches. The traditional approach is basically you're looking at where crashes are happening and being reactive to helping to improve those conditions where there's those crashes. Um, with Vision Zero, we're saying that, you know, deaths, serious injuries are preventable, so we want to take preventive actions before we get to the point where there's a failure somewhere in the system, whether it's behavior or an infrastructure that leads to a serious injury or a fatality. Um, right here, you can see this. Um, the, the, the goal of Vision Zero is a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and serious injuries while increasing safe and healthy, equitable mobility for all. So that equity and that multimodalism is an important factor too, which we'll talk about as we kind of go through the presentation. So this is kind of our specific goals that we worked with the community in building our action plan. And again, our action plan was basically from the time in 2019 that the board adopted the initiative to develop an action plan to 2021 when it was adopted. That was two years of engagement and really bringing um, the community along this journey to develop that plan. Because we, we realized that without the community's input and involvement, um, you know, we could have, you know, quite frankly, perfect infrastructure, right? But we'll still see you know, serious injuries and crashes because if people, if all people aren't participating, um, then it doesn't really, it's not really effective. So it takes a whole community to kind of build that effort collectively um, to make sure that you're reaching that goal of uh, zero fatalities, zero serious injuries. So with the community, we worked on these different aspects right here, these different goals, and you can see um, First is a, a multimodal, meaning that we will have um, safe transportation for all people, no matter how you get around. And that's always changing, right? That's a changing dynamic we see. Um, I think we've been talking to some of you too, and you see that you have scooters out in the streets now. So that's a dynamic which, with which streets weren't designed for, so we gotta figure out how to integrate those into a safe and balanced system. Um, Second is safety first, meaning that safety is going to be the paramount factor in any project that we look at on our transportation system. Uh, the third thing is being transparent and accountable, just meaning that in the way that we do our, conduct our business, the way that we operate the roadways, the way that we engage on projects is going to be apparent to everybody so that they can be part of the solution. Uh, rather than us dictating what that, that solution is always. Uh, Data-driven, uh, this is one of those key things because w without data, we don't really know if we're marching towards that end goal, right? And it's important for us to know if we're marching towards that end goal of zero fatalities and serious injuries um, as soon as possible, so we're not aiming off target, if you will. Um, so we will talk more about data, but that is one of those key things. Um, and you'll see in our plans why we do such frequent data investigations. Uh, collaborative, meaning that um, we promote a safety culture in all aspects of our lives with everybody we interact with. 
in our department, um, we, you know, I require our uh, bureau to uh, do driver training bi-monthly. So this month is our defensive driver training. Um, in you know, a couple months, they'll have another course. And again, just everybody is part of making the roadway network safe. And finally, equitable. Equitable is just making sure that areas that might have been underserved in the past, um, people that might have been underserved in the past, have the opportunity to have that same um, uh, quality transportation system. Okay, so um, the two kind of key parts of a, a Vision Zero uh, program, a data-driven program, are the responsive and proactive, right? We always have to do the responsive, right? That's what most of your traditional safety programs are uh, predicated on or built off of, that responsive, um, uh, crash analysis. The first item that you see there, that critical crash follow-up, uh, that is a little unique from some of the things in the past, but what that is, is what we bring together is each quarter we get um, uh, a review of every severe and fatal crash that we have on the roadways. Then we bring uh, uh, together a team uh, consisting of people from DOT, from our police um, units, um, and other stakeholders, uh, our county manager's office, where we look at, for that quarter, um, what were those critical, the severe or fatal crashes. And that's within a couple of weeks of, uh, of that quarter ending. So we do this quickly so it can be responsive. And then we see what kind of low-hanging fruit there is to um, address some of those issues that we see on the roadway. So it's pretty simple, but again, having that data accessible in a timely manner is, very, is really critical. Um, questions? Yeah, you? this is a, a quick question. Sure. Um, the, a lot of the fatalities tend to um, come from driving under the influence of uh, either drugs or alcohol or something else. How do those get factored into here, or are those in a separate category? No, we, we, so we go over, uh, over every critical crash every quarter, including the ones where there's alcohol involved. Um, now, Admittedly, it's harder to tell what to do in those you know, uh, situations. Uh, for us, typically, at least three quarters to maybe 100% of our crashes involve alcohol, uh, or of our fatal crashes, that is. And so it's really difficult you know, uh, to do engineering measures, but again, we are doing safety campaigns, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but we're more focused on some of the kind of uh, in the field engineering things that you can do this evening. Um, but yes, we work with the police and force, uh, law enforcement on safety campaigns for um, you know, trying to mitigate uh, people driving under the influence or even walking under the influence. Uh, so we are doing education campaigns as well. Um, but that's a, that's a difficult uh, thing that we still see as a challenge, but continually doing that outreach and providing resources so that uh, people have alternatives um, to driving is is a is a critical factor in that. Um, but again, you know, there are still severe crashes too that don't involve alcohol. Where we're doing low, um, you know, quick countermeasures. Like if there's sight distance that we see is blocked, we'll go out and improve the sight distance. If we see that we can adjust signal timing or you know, put back plates on the signal or do something that helps um, in decrease the um, factors that contribute to a crash, we'll do that in the short term. So it's a difficult thing, admittedly, um, but you know, we are trying to at least eliminate factors in most of those cases that um, contribute to a crash. But thank you for that question. No. And so you must have, it, well, do you have to wait for three months before you get um, reports from the police on which accidents were caused by what? Because here we wait for probably 30 days, it seems like, before, I mean, you get more information off the newspaper than you do. do you, what's your rapport with the police? Do we you have, have somebody that actually sends you stuff or do you have to request it or? We, we have a relationship where we exchange that information regularly. And so we're pretty quickly able to look at our critical crashes in the quarter and meet and discuss those. So it's, it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, so we've invested in that relationship, though. So you know, we, we have 
um, you know, built this kind of synergy, built this trust uh, w amongst each other where we exchange that information because we realize the sooner that we can get it and discuss that information, the better. Um, so, you know, again, sometimes it takes bit time to build that, that synergy and that trust. But we are very fortunate because we've invested in that over the years. That's a good question. Um, so, uh, the second item on the responsive list is, is kind of what you see more as uh, the kind of traditional approach when you think of safety, right? You're looking at hotspots. Where are those clusters of crashes? We still do that too. Um, and then we will deploy countermeasures to help address those. Sometimes we'll do short-term things, sometimes medium, and sometimes longer-term things are needed to address those situations. And we'll talk about the programs a little bit more. Um, we have a high injury network and we conduct safety audits on the high injury network. And the high injury network is just basically where we see that there's the greatest density of crashes on our street systems. Sometimes there are streets, sometimes there's streets that are owned by uh, the state agency, our, which is Virginia Department of Transportation, VIA. So we'll work together on identifying those, doing these road safety audits, and coming up with, again, short term, medium term, and long term uh, countermeasures. Um, and then we have an online portal where community members can report a problem, and we will investigate those. You know, a community member goes in online and describes the problem, and we'll assign an engineer and we'll get an investigation. Um, so those are the four kind of responsive tools that we use to address safety. And projects can come out of any of those, too, mind you. And I'll talk more about the project <laughs> side in a little bit. Uh, but the proactive side is, you know, what is kind of different about Vision Zero, about, you know, that, it, you know, if you're really going to reach that goal of zero, these are the things that you really need to look at as well. Uh, so the systemic improvements um, are things that you can do uh, in a repeated manner, okay? So if you see that you have a particular type of crash, let's say it's a pedestrian crash in an uncontrolled crossing, you can deploy a measure, a countermeasure, right, to improve that condition, but you can deploy it at all similar locations. So that's what that systemic improvement is. You look at what are the types of crashes that um, you are most prevalent, and you look at deploying the same countermeasures regardless of whether there's a crash or not. So that's something that we've done um, over the past two or three years since we've adopted our Vision Zero action plan as well. We talked about equity too, looking at how equity affects people as well. So we are actually looking at the cross-section of, of certain things like systemic safety and equity emphasis. And so we'll look at our equity areas where there's people that are underserved and we'll like start systemic improvements in those areas first. Again, just looking for opportunities on how to prioritize projects and to get the most bandwidth, the most dispersed uh, treatments that we can get. And then of course community education. That's something I mentioned too and you know, we had a question about you know, how do you address you know, driving or walking or you know, doing anything under the influence, and it's difficult. But we do have um, safety campaigns that look at how we outreach uh, different people. And right here, this is just, you know, we, we do put up posters that show where our critical crash areas are. You know, we put, this is actually a, a capital bike share station. So we do this uh, different places. We actually are starting a campaign where we are putting things on our signal poles, and these are just zip-tied information plaques where somebody could, um, there's a QR code, somebody could scan and look at what is a LPI, and a LPI, sorry, is a lead pedestrian interval, which gives somebody, uh, a pedestrian, a few seconds head start um, before any vehicles get a corresponding movement. Um, but, you know, so people don't necessarily always understand that term and what the benefit of that lead pedestrian interval, that LPI is, right? So we will have signs that we put up that says, the LPI gives you a few seconds head start where there's no vehicle movement so you can get out into the intersection and establish yourself before crossing. So we do things like that to educate people what the safety measures we deploy are and how they can benefit people. Um, so, uh, one of the things too I had mentioned as well was that 
uh, one of the key factors and one of the challenges in safety, and in any you know, transportation agency, is how you balance all these different needs, how you balance the different modes. Uh, in Arlington, over the years, we've gotten to you know, the, the walk-friendly platinum community status. And again, a lot of the efforts here are that kind of proactive things that we are trying to do. Um, you know, we're not perfect, nobody's perfect, but we're trying to do the best we can to look at how we can accommodate people um, walking on our roadways. And we'll talk about some of those things. A silver bicycle friendly community um, shows that there's room for us to improve in that area. But again, looking at um, how we enhance bicyclists, how we enhance bicycle safety by providing um, more protected types of facilities. Um, I did talk about for uh, the different modes, you know, or you know that multimodalism is really important to us. But you can just see here is you know basically the numbers for Metro Rail um, over forty thousand. Uh, I just flew in from DCA today. Uh, carries a lot of people. Uh, we have a lot of transit over um, uh, one point five million people served there. Capital bike share where you rent a bike. Okay, that's where you can rent a bike on a you know minute-by-minute minute basis. Uh, scooters, um, those have taken off a lot, and other e-shared bike trips and things like that. So, you know, we have a truly multi mile system where we're trying to evaluate those needs of this ever-evolving dynamic um, and how you address that from a safety standpoint. So going back to the data is really, really important. Um, you can see a typical multimodal street tries to incorporate all these elements. You have your bicycling, you have your pedestrian zones, um, transit, sometimes sharing with bicyclists, vehicle, um, and this is what, when I say a separated bicycle facility, you mean something that is separated from the uh, moving vehicle travel lanes, either by parking or by planters or some other device. Um, and of course, you got your pedestrian zoning there again. So there's a lot of different methods we'll talk about to bring that multimodal safety. But the challenge is, is always how do you integrate that? And understanding the numbers of what you're trying to serve, understanding the safety record is something that you have to continually look at to, since it's an evolving dynamic. Uh, the most important thing though is uh, with Vision Zero, it is our document that gives us the ability to go back and say, look, we are putting safety first. Always, we are putting safety first. And that means we are protecting our most vulnerable users very often, right? It's people walking, rolling, biking, those modes where, um, you know, if they are in a crash, it tends to be more severe. So now, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what are those tools that we can use to help improve safety on this multimodal multi -multi perspective? Um, so one of the things we did when we started our Vision Zero Action Plan is we kind of set ourselves up for looking at a lot of other plans that would follow from that. You know, rather than saying our Vision Zero Action Plan is going to incorporate everything that's needed, we said it's going to be our roadmap of how we're going to address safety over the next five years, right? And then we evaluate that in that five-year mark and then redo that, that, that roadmap which is that plan. Um, so one of those things that came out of uh, the plan that said we would do as a follow-on effort is establish this multimodal engineering uh, safety toolbox. Okay, and this toolbox uh, was published uh, last year, um, but the, the benefit of this is that it's used to inform uh, stakeholders, um, you know, what are those typical things they could see out on the street? How do you act when you see them, right? Um, I use the case of an LPI, a lead pedestrian interval. You know, how does that benefit somebody? Uh, separated uh, bicycle lane, how does that benefit somebody? But if you're a motorist too, you know, what kind of actions do you need to take when you see somebody in one of those uh, separated bicycle lanes? Because even though it's a, a separated bicycle lane, there's always some interaction, right, with vehicles um, at intersections and things like that. So, it's an informative document on you know, what the measures are and how they're applied as well 
so that the, the hope is, you know, we have a very highly engaged community, and that's part of what we want to do through Vision Zero. Um, but the hope is, is that it helps streamline our deployment, because we see that um, if we are really going to tackle the safety issue, is every project, some projects will take three years or four years or five years, but every project can't do that, because then we'll never catch up with what we want to achieve um, with our safety goals. Um, it's also used for coordination with different departments, right? Uh, we work with police, we work with fire. If we all want to talk that same language, we have that document um, so that we can, you know, reference it uh, together and have that common understanding. Um, it's written, and I, I might have glanced over that a little bit, but it's written for a community audience as well, again, to help facilitate the quick implementation of and I actually did bring a copy with me if you want to look at it at some point, so um, you can just kind of see me afterwards. And I'll, I can share a link to it because it is posted online. But I will go through and highlight some measures right now. So most of these are things that are proven to improve safety. Not all of them, and I'll point out some of them that aren't, but we felt that they were important including because we felt that was an, an important way to experiment on how um, we utilize things to address safety. Um, so crossings and signals right here. Um, you can see the upper right hand corner uh, raised uh, refuge island. That just basically helps shorten a crossing for a pedestrian, right? They're, when they hit a refuge island, when they're crossing to a refuge island, it's a, typically an area where they're not in conflict with another mode. So again, shorting the crossing, less exposure for Pedestrians. Protected intersections. This is new in most areas. It's new to us as well. We have our first fully protected intersection that just went online um, a couple months ago through um, in our Crystal City area right next to Amazon headquarters too. Uh, we do have some partially protected intersections, but basically what that is, is when you have that protected bike lane, that is a bike lane that's running curbside, that is separated from the through traffic either by, um, uh, you know, planters or some sort of, you know, hard device or parked vehicles. And the intersections where everything crosses over, you keep that protection through the intersection. Um, so that's something that is um, we're deploying, and we're getting some more experience using. But again, the intention of that, as is the refuge island, is to separate different modes, right? You see where that vehicle space is, you see where the pedestrian space is, and you see that bicycle space is, and you set up some expectation that they will get used in a certain way, right? And hopefully, you know, we see good usage. We see people when they are interacting that they're looking out for each other, right? Because if you're crossing a street, like from a, see the raised refuge island there, what do you do typically? Try to get the driver's attention, right? So you want to make sure you maintain that eye contact. So these things help facilitate, um, you know, better interactions between different modes as well. Uh, hard and center line internal widgets. This is something that we haven't deployed yet, but we will begin deploying. Um, and that's basically what you can see is you just basically um, when you harden your center line, you're putting something, uh, some sort of flexible tactical device on that center line so that you're preventing people from making wide sweeping turns. And that's the same for the, the turn widgets. You're preventing people from making wide turns, which tend to be faster, so they have to make sharper turns, which are typically slower. One of the things that you'll hear me say today and tomorrow is speed is one of those things that we're really trying to control. Because if you can control speed, then you can reduce risk. Right? You can reduce risk and reduce severity. And so that's one of those measures that does that. Um, pedestrian hybrid beacons, uh, I think most people are familiar with that, but that's just, you know, when you push a button, the beacon will flash, um, will, will flash to yellow, then go red, and then flashing red, and enables pedestrians to cross. And an RFB is like that yellow beacon. Are there RFBs here? Yeah. So, I'll talk more about RFBs, but that's, again, another crossing device to help people. 
phasing modifications is just changing the phasing of your signal. Um, crossing signs and embarkings are just enhancements that you can do to crossings with um, signs and markings. Daylighting is just uh, basically opening up sight lines and putting things where people might park to block sight lines, like here in this case, this is, this is a driveway right here. And if people, if this weren't there, people might block that sight lines of people driving out of the driveway, which could you know, lead to a conflict. Um, and then finally, uh, stop sign control, which I will talk a little bit more detail, but again, when we talk about stop sign control, we're talking about following the manual of uniform traffic control devices, just to be clear. And that's the tool that all engineers use that kind of guide what, you know, when you go from Idaho to Virginia, it makes, you know, it assures that you'll see the same sign that has the same meeting from state to state. Um, here's some uh, additional crossing uh, measures. These are generally some of them are more expensive traffic signals. Self-explanatory, a little more expensive traffic signal backplates, or just the backplates around the signal to enhance the visibility of the signal. Um, travel lane signs and markings, that's pretty self-explanatory. It's everything you see on the road, painted in white or yellow. Um, lead pedestrian intervals, I talked about that very briefly, and we'll talk about it some more. Uh, Red light cameras, which we do by legislation, we are authorized to do that, <coughs> and no turn on red signs. <coughs> so the pedestrian bicycle piece, uh, a contraflow bicycle lane is just a bicycle lane that goes in the opposite direction of vehicle travel. We do use those in a few locations just for connectivity. I um, talked about separated bicycle lanes, and you can see there that's separated by parking. <coughs> the conventional bike lanes are just the typical five foot bike lane you see on the roadway, multi use trails, pathways, sidewalks, buffered bike lanes. It's similar to conventional but has a little bit more separation. Green pavement markings. Uh, I was talking to some of you before. Green pavement markings are a tool that we've used more frequently to show where those conflict points are between bicycles and vehicles, right? Green now carries that signification that it means a conflict point or something where both those modes should be on the lookout. Um, and then bike boxes or a two-stage two turn box is another type of green marking that just helps people execute a left turn by not going into a left turn lane, but they can kind of stay on that right side of the roadway and wait in the box and then cross at the intersection once the, the um, parallel movement gets agreed. So that's kind of the theory behind that. And curb ramps, self-explanatory. Uh, transit facilities, we do have transit priority lanes, transit stops with shelters, floating bus stop, is similar to a transit stop with a shelter, um, except that it's separated from the sidewalk by a protected bike lane, right? So in order to get to the floating bus stop, you, the pedestrian has to walk from the sidewalk to the bus stop. And a bus queue jump is just um, something that helps promote transit priority and avoid conflict with vehicles. Um, a few more tools. Uh, speed and traffic management. So those school zones are one of our major initiatives that we've uh, kind of undertaken with Vision Zero. Um, it is one of those things that we, uh, I think, recognized early on that you know most people would be supportive of, right? Everybody wants, you know, it's, it's hard to argue against the safety of kids around the school, right? So what we started implementing, and we will finish uh, this year is all of our schools, we have 40 public schools um, approximately and um, uh, approximately a dozen pretty large private schools. Um, so we will put in slow school zones around all those areas and basically it's 20 mile hour zone within uh, 600 feet of a school uh, that's loosely saying 600 feet. Um, 600 feet of a school access that is 
Um, so it's a little wider area. Um, but uh, again, pavement markings, uh, the, the area, the, the image just below that, we're putting 20 mile an hour on the pavement in addition to the signage in those slow school zones. And where we do have problems, again, <clears throat> part of the success of any plan is when you see you're deploying something and if it's not working as you intended, then you have to take that next step in terms of what is the next action. So we do have some slow school zones that we've deployed. We see that are decreasing speeds. Some of them are not. And so in those areas, uh, this fall, we're gonna deploy uh, what we say are these tactical speed helps, just these kits you can buy. Um, and they're made out of rubberized materials and you just kind of install them, see if that works. And if, you know, if it's working, then you know, we might move to a more permanent solution. But this is something that we can put down and pick up and you know, um, put where it's needed pretty easily. Yes, question? On your school zone, is that 24-7 or is it time related to when the school is in session? It's a great question. So, our school zones have two different um, uh, types of speed limits. On our neighborhood streets, primarily, it's permanent 20 mile an hour speed limit. That's why we put it in, in writing on the pavement, right? Um, on some of our arterials, um, it'll be flashing. It'll be 20 miles an hour when flashing, right? Um, so, that's kind of it in general. There's some exceptions uh, on everything, right? But that's kind of generally how we do it. Does that answer it? Question? Okay. That's a good question. Thank you. Um, talk about speed humps a little bit. Uh, we do, so we, we just are becoming a state that is authorizing speed cameras. But that is only in slow school, in school zones and in work zones. So um, that was seen as the, the kind of the, best way to kind of introduce that as a, as a countermeasure in the state. Is that popular or is that controversial? The, the speed cameras? Um, well, again, I think that, you know, from a legislative standpoint, the people, they got what they could in terms of um, the, you know, getting a speed camera on a little, on a limited application just work zones and school zones was seen as something that was harder to, um, you know, work against. So again, it's just confined to those two conditions. Um, and, you know, we haven't implemented it yet in Arlington. Some other jurisdictions in Virginia have implemented them. Um, and, you know, we're very new to this in this state, in Virginia. So we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. But right now, our plans are for deploying them only in uh, slow school zones in, as a, in initially. Um, so we still have to work on a methodology for how we de would deploy that in a work zone. But we developed this really robust methodology in terms of how we identify the school zone. And it's based off of speed, as you can guess. It's based off of crash data. Um, and there's some other factors too we look at as well. Yes. It's a question on like the implementation of uh, like speed humps. Um, what kind of coordination did you have with like the emergency services type groups? And did you have any challenges in terms of like working with them and getting them implemented? So we, we do work with them on uh, on the implementation, um, and that is something that um, is. Uh, lack of a better description is something that's a dynamic that you know we have to just kind of work through together right because obviously you know, their concern is providing that safety um, and that safe access you know whether it be at any type of emergency right um, so the what so what we're doing now what I described is the tactical ones we're saying these are things that you know we're testing and seeing um, if it's having a positive effect and so you know, that's kind of the way we're, we're working with uh, police and fire now. Um, and, um, you know, it's not a permanent device, but 
we'll see how long we keep it in place and how effective it is. So, um, yeah, it's it's something you just have to kind of like be upfront and say, look, this is the problem. We understand that you have a need too that you're trying to serve, but we're trying to, you know, create a safer environment. So this is kind of a, a good place for us right now are these tactical devices. Um, speed limit reduction and policy. So again, recognizing the importance of speeding in uh, safety, we've gone through uh, an evaluation of about half of our roadways now in terms of uh, the posted speed limit. And now on our county-owned roadways, because again, we do have a few state-owned roadways, but on our county-owned roadways, we do not have a posted speed limit of greater than 30 miles an hour through this process. So um, again, a little bit different area than here, um, but on our county-owned streets, we do not have a speed limit over 30. Um, and we're still going through an evaluation of some of our um, you know, posted speed limit on some of our streets. So we might have some of the remaining 30 mile an hour streets reduced to 25, but we have to see, you know, kind of what makes sense from the engineering standpoint. We've worked with the state on this too, and the, and the state has worked um, in reducing the speed, limit, the speed limits on some roadways too. Again, recognizing, you know, just because you lower the speed limit doesn't mean people are going to drive slower, right? So we're really trying to look at what is that context and what is that need, right? So a lot of times you know, speed limits were made 10, 15 years ago, and as the area changes, you know, as schools or density gets developed and built, you know, you have to really be able to look at is, is it still the best speed limit, right? And so that's kind of what we've done and that's what we committed to doing. Um, is reviewing those policies. Uh, speed feedback signs, uh, that's another measure, and again, that just tells you your, your speed. Um, when you're going down the street, it doesn't issue a ticket, it's just to help um, inform people and hopefully is uh, a deterrent for, for people to speed. Uh, chicanes, and we can talk about this a little bit more, but chicanes is basically, you know, when you have a, a straight roadway is you introduce some sort of horizontal deflection so that people can't just drive straight and fast but they have to steer right and left so that they um, are forced to slow down uh, so chicanes are a tool that we use in our um, neighborhoods as our traffic circles and this is not a roundabout a traffic circle is just basically a circle in the middle of a, a neighborhood intersection that again forces people to slow down by not allowing them to drive straight through the intersection. They have to kind of, you know, take an indirect path through the intersection. So wait a minute, I, I've, heard, I've usually heard of these like in countless ski racing. Are these put in like after the development is there? Traffic circles? No, I'm sorry, the chicanes. I'm going there. Uh, so chicanes are, you know, the way we use them is kind of more of a retrofit. So meaning it's we, like, the, it's just an illusion. Road is really straight. The road is straight, but we are doing things so that people cannot drive straight. So, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but this is actually you're causing these. You see the sign right here? This sign? You, this is how people have to drive because we actually, you know, kind of twisted the uh, alignment. And in this case, you can see here the, the way we did that is by offsetting parking, staggering parking, right? Um, so you have, we have a band of parking for about 100 feet on one side and then a band of about a, more than 100 feet, a couple hundred feet on the other side. So you have to kind of, you know, you have to kind of, you know, weave your way through the, through the parked vehicles, if you will. But it's still two-way traffic. It's still two-way traffic, yeah. That's why the, you, you can see here at the, uh, yellow center line. It's still two-way traffic. Scott one takes it down to one-way traffic. Okay. Yep. And there's you different to ways wait, to do it. You have to wait for the oncoming car to get through it before you can go. Okay. There's different ways to do it. Okay. Your pointer should be working on your nose. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> there. Okay. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> So uh, yeah, so you can see here, that is
is actual deflection by having the parking staggered from this side to the other side, right? And there's different ways to do it. This is just one way that I'm showing right here. So that we've seen deployed as well. Uh, and then finally, here's some other tools that we deploy. Um, a modern roundabout, which is basically um, traffic control from all approaches in the roundabout are yield, right? So you yield to traffic in the roundabout. And in general, uh, roundabouts have better safety records, slower speeds. Um, so you know, this is kind of why we use them, why we promote them. <coughs> Curb extensions, you can see here, it's just really narrowing of the, of the roadway um, at the crossings so that there's less exposure for pedestrians and it helps slow people down when they're turning. Uh, roadway reconfigurations. Um, basically what we're saying there is like when you take, when you see a roadway, right? You see a roadway and you look at how you can, you know, if it's dedicated to one mode, it's typically more to vehicles, right? But you look at how you can kind of carve that up in different ways to provide, um, you know, use for either, sometimes it's transit, uh, often it's bicyclists, sometimes it could be uh, pedestrians, parking other uses. You look at how you can reconfigure that space so that it is a more multimodal street than just uh, a street dedicated to one mode. And of course lighting is important too, especially um, for safety at night. So um, the toolkit, this is just an example of some of the information that you can see. <coughs> um, so we do have graphics that depict all these different um, um, elements right here. So you can see it compares the conventional to the contraflow bike lane, to the buffered bike lane, and then the separated bicycle facility. But what we are aiming for is the, this crash reduction, right? So these are from national data, the, the crash reduction. Sometimes we don't have something that is quantitative. And so if we don't have a quantitative crash reduction, we are looking to study that um, so we can get a better quantitative measure. Because again, if we're deploying something, we're doing something out in the field, we want to make sure it's effective in addressing the safety problem, right? Um, timeline just shows how long it takes to develop or deploy these different measures, and of course, cost just is an indicator also of how long it takes and how much money you need to do things. There's other things too that are in the toolkit uh, as well. This is just kind of a quick summary table so you can kind of get a sense of how we try to um, uh, share this information so that we all can speak more of the same language. Um, there's other information um, such as, uh, you know, what, what are the uh, potential challenges you need to think about. Also, what types of roadways, what classification of roadways um, are uh, appropriate for certain uh, tools, because not all tools work on all roadways. So there's different elements, too, and different things that really help describe the use of these tools as well. So um, any questions on some of the typical tools that we use? Yes. Since you're the head engineer, how do you budget for all this? Since oh. you go through all these studies, so all you're the setting the solution. This up. You're setting this up for oh, me okay. perfectly, because that's what we're going to talk about right okay. now. That's great. Great question. I will answer it. If I don't, please raise your hand again. Um, any other questions on any of the tools, though? Yes. How many of those tools are uh, that you guys identified were like, previously used, you had pretty good examples of them being implemented, first were something new, didn't really have many great examples, but kind of thought they were like worth trying. Does most of them, sense? most of them have been tried okay. before. You know, most of them are, we have some pretty good common understanding of um, how they work, where they work. You know, some of the ones that, um, you know, I did point out uh, the uh, contraflow lane right here. So the contraflow lane shows reduced risk, but we don't really have any quantitative data. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, some of the other things that we don't have a lot of information on, believe it or not, speed 
feedback signs, right? So that's something we'll investigate. Um, we're actually investigating the speed-related signage and pavement markings as well, um, because we know that people can see them, right? Which is good, but are people actually you know, doing what's there? So we're just kind of seeing if that has an additional effect on anything. Um, Floating bus stops is um, something that we don't have a lot of information on. We um, are pretty new to the game in terms of Arlington. Um, I don't know if you have any protected bicycle facilities here or. Uh, yeah, we have a floating bus stop too. Yeah, we have a couple on um, front. For, uh, yeah. Sorry, Maine, where it's very. Yeah, yeah. So it's fairly new within the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. So same with us. We actually had four built this year. Um, the challenge that we're seeing with that is communicating the kind of new condition to somebody who might, you know, not have you know, their full vision, right? Because now they have to cross a bike lane, whereas before they didn't, right? I think but the, the drivers as well, I think cars got hit. The first few weeks it was up. Really? Yeah, I think somebody tagged it pretty good. Yeah, I don't know if they made any changes based on that, but there was a, a news article about how people kept running kind of inside of it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So maybe the we haven't had drivers that. too, but also the people yeah. using the stop. Yeah, maybe you know some flashing lights or something. Yeah. Um, but that's something that we're evaluating, and something we're working on a regional level. And this is one of those things that we're working with um, uh, the MPO with. Um, the regional transit partner um, to try to figure out is there some sort of consistency we can have throughout the region because you have DC does it one way and you have Montgomery County which is in Maryland that does it a different way we've been doing it a different way so we're trying to you know bring out all that information together to see like if there's a consistent approach um, but of course with us being newer to the game and deploying so many we have about 20 in design right now. Um, I think a lot of the ask of, well, they should have this and this and this, right? And one of the this is, is um, uh, guidance strips, right? Not the truncated domes, right? The truncated domes you see at any curb ramp, right? Um, that's the little tiny dots that tell you're walking out into a conflict area. So the guidance strips that we're being asked to deploy at these uh, floating bus islands are the linear ones. Same height and dimension generally, but they're linear. So if somebody that has a cane, they can, or and presumably a cane, you know, they can feel along to see how they're being guided to this bus stop, which is on this island now. So um, again, we think from a safety standpoint, it's good because you're separating the modes, right? You don't have bicyclists out in traffic anymore, but now you have uh, a different dynamic that we're trying to figure out is, is the bicycle pedestrian dam uh, dynamic something that we can mitigate. So, good On your bike lanes, do you have speed limits for bicyclists? We don't. That's a good question, though. Well, People have asked got that. some guys that can <laughs> pedal 30 miles an hour and others that are yeah. struggling to get 10. We don't. Um, We've been asked that. I well, the e-bikes will be another challenge for you. So we don't have data, I will say. Again, I'll go back to the, the point I'm making about data. We don't have data that shows it's a, a high-risk okay. conflict for us yet. And again, that's something that I want to really emphasize, the necessity of monitoring this thing. It's not like you, OK, we checked it, and you just push it away or push it off to the side. Something that you have to really look at because, you know, we have more of these conditions that will be in the field. Um, so, something we need to actively investigate and monitor. Um, and we do monitor a lot of that. And we're going to talk about that. So, you're again leading into what we will be talking about shortly. So, yes. do you have um, rules of the road for bicyclists? In Idaho, it is. You're supposed to stop if there's traffic, but if there's no traffic, you can run a red light, you can run a stop sign. I got personally mowed over walking across the street by a bicyclist. He leaped up, he fell over, leaped up, grabbed me under the arms, put me up, said, are you okay? And took off like a rocket. 
never even said sorry, never said boo. I mean, he just hit me, blindsided me. And um, so people getting, driving in these bike lanes, are they still, well, because they're smaller, they're still gonna be, the bigger guy has to look out for them, but right. you don't have any, well, you, you're just putting some of this stuff in, so you don't know yet. How we, it's gonna we do have, you know, uh, we, we do have enforcement we work with that we flag critical conditions that we want them to help us with. <coughs> So, you know, sometimes it is this um, bicycle-pedestrian interaction. Um, it's a little harder to pinpoint that in a specific location, right? Um, but, um, you know, a lot of times it's vehicles and, you know, compliance with, like, some of the signs that, that I had showed you, like the no right on red, um, complying with, um, you know, always stop or, or things like that. So. You know, we have a relatively small police force and limited resources, but it is something that we have monthly meetings with them on. Here's all the things that we know that are issues that we see, because I mentioned like one of the things that we hear a lot about. Uh, we do collect proactive data, but we also have that reporter problem. And so sometimes when we get that reporter problem, somebody will say, you know, there's speeding, and we'll first verify it, right? <clears throat> if there is, and we don't really have any short-term solution, that's something that we'll work with law enforcement, and then we'll look for a longer-term solution, or do some other speed management thing um, that, that we can deploy in the short term. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something that is, again, I think the key to really finding success is collaborating you know, across the board, and even with the community, too. Any other questions? All right. So, um, all right. So, identifying a safety issue is really important to make sure you understand what's going on so you can deploy the right measures, right? Um, so, uh, you know, again, it, and it doesn't just end with doing that initial analysis. You have to evaluate what you put in the field, right, to make sure that it's working. Um, and sometimes, and what we'll talk about is, you know, it's an iterative process, right? You do something, and again, you're just trying to eliminate risk factors as you deploy things. You're kind of trying to peel off some of those risk factors to reduce risk and opportunity for crashes. So, this is how you do an investigation. This is how we're doing an investigation, right? Um, I talked about these different uh, safety data analyses right here uh, that we typically do and again it's not like we do it and put it on the shelf but we're doing it on a regular cycle we're looking at crash hotspots um, we're doing an annual crash review to understand like was this year better than last year are we heading in the right direction uh, we have the high injury network where we do the the safety audits right we're looking at what is the low hanging fruit what is the low short term things we is the medium? What are the long-term things? We're doing that systemic and predictive crash analysis. So the systemic, again, this is an important thing to, to remember, is where you see a common type of crash you have and you address it holistically, right? Not at just the one location where you see the crash, but all similar locations that have similar traits. Um, the predictive crash analysis is something that we've entered in uh, a little bit with uh, some of our kind of more frequent uh, analysis tools, like our hotspots, um, our high injury network, where we'll take uh, data that's you know from uh, cellular devices, right? We'll kind of mine that data. You ever use streetlight data here? Okay, so streetlight data is like one of these things that you know basically takes um, information from yes, right? location-based yep. services. Yep, location-based services, and um, you know gives you different measures. Um, and so one of those measures that we use as a predictive method right now is heartbreaking. 
So we look at hard braking in terms of not just hot spots, but hot spots. Maybe if we see a location that has a lot of hard braking, it kind of elevates it to a hot spot. So that predictive tools will become increasingly important because of that proactive um, uh, method that we have to follow if we're going to get ahead of reducing the crashes. So um, one of the questions that was asked in terms of like, you know, how do you fund and do all this? This is just high level now, we'll dig a little bit deeper in a moment. But one of the things that we do is we look for opportunities. And one of those best opportunities is through repaving, right? When we repave, we basically have a blank slate with the roadway. So it gives us the chance to, sometimes we can reconfigure, sometimes it's enhancing pedestrian or bicyclist safety. Um, we look at what's feasible. And we go through an engagement process to figure out what the best solution is um, on our roadways when we're repaving. Um, and um, again, you know, we're, we're trying to look at what that low-hanging fruit is. Um, but again, getting that community feedback is important, not necessarily in terms of what the solutions are, but what the issues are. Because if we can accurately identify the issues, then we're more likely to have a response that's effective. Um, stormwater projects, you know, with a lot of our stormwater projects, we're building moving curb, right? So is there an opportunity to change the width of the street or put in, um, you know, one of the tools that I mentioned, like, uh, you know, putting in a bump out, right? So that there's a shorter crossing for pits. So look for that, those opportunities. Uh, there are capital improvement projects that you'll need because sometimes you'll see you have a hot spot or a corridor that, you know, um, you've done everything that's that low-hanging fruit, and you need to kind of take it to the next level and invest in it. And then through site development plans, um, we actually have a lot of development. We have uh, some processes which are uh, fairly robust in trying to get uh, transportation uh, improvements through those um, redevelopment. Um, an example is, uh, well, one of the tools we use, we call it a multimodal transportation assessment. So a developer for certain size developments needs to do this assessment that looks at safety. They do a crash analysis. Of course, they do the operational analysis and they do other analyses. But in that, they have to propose mitigations, not just for operational um, needs, right? Because with new development, presumably comes additional traffic. So not just the operational needs, but the safety needs as well. Um, and, and again, I'll mention too that, you know, through a lot of our redevelopments, through headquarters to Amazon, the protected intersection was something that was uh, delivered as part of that project. So it's a fully protected intersection um, that's delivered um, through the development of that um, headquarters to from Amazon. So that's the kind of typical dynamic we try to set up when we're doing uh, site planning development. Uh, planning studies, of course, these are longer term efforts where we're looking at um, you know, how do we address and invest properly in the, in the long term. Quarter plans, sector plans. Quarter plans are you know, just a major quarter. How do we address safety, um, multimodalism on a, on a quarter? Uh, sector plan is, you know, these small kind of, for us, small neighborhood areas. How do we kind of integrate a neighborhood so that, you know, if somebody is going to this neighborhood as a destination, that they can, if they're driving, then they can walk once they drive, right? Or they can bike around, or they can get there by different modes too. But again, just trying to build in, um, you know, amenities and, um, facilities that help um, usher in kind of a more cohesive network around these areas. And of course, I have mentioned this a few times, is that community feedback and requests, we track and it helps inform all the things that we're doing, um, could be short all the way up to, to long term. So here's the process. <coughs> um, ways we identify potential projects, we talked about the safety data, right? 
Um, there are capital and development projects, and development is a developer, capital is something that will initiate. Um, and then a planning study is like, you know, looking for the long-term goals of, of an area or corridor, and then a community feedback. All that goes into um, identifying a location with a potential safety issue, right? And then you analyze that location, right? And this is the type of data that we typically consider when we're analyzing that location. Again, it goes through all these different um, methods right there. So uh, we could consider uh, crash history and uh, crash patterns. Uh, we look at that from a lot of different ways. The speed, we say 85th percentile speed sometimes, and that's just the speed at which 85% of the people are driving slower. Um, but we also look at other speed measures too, like the median speed and, and things of that nature to just understand um, how speed affects uh, things on the street. Um, we look for operational behaviors, and that's when I say we do the safety audits, right? Um, how are people actually using the roadway, right? And that kind of ties in with that other observational data too. Um, but we also look at you know operations too, because that's one of those critical things. Because poor operations very often do lead to safety issues. So um, you know if we follow the process and data doesn't support, you know, if we did an analysis, then there's no further action. But often, you know, we confirm some sort of safety issue, then we look at the appropriate tools. Uh, and this is what I was referring to a little bit in the toolbox discussion. So we look at, you know, what type of street is it, right? What's the context? Um, what's the surrounding land use? Um, what's the, we say classification, is it arterial or is it a neighborhood? Um, what are the uh, modes that are expected to use it or the primary use? The challenge we face very often is that the expectation sometimes is that all streets will be all things to all modes, right? Meaning you'll have transit, bikes, pedestrians, scooters, um, vehicles, deliveries, and in reality that's not always the case. So we look at, you know, how do we kind of prioritize that um, in an effective way? Um, and that's obviously more, on a, more important to do on a network basis, but sometimes we can do that on a street by street basis. Um, we look at uh, what is the potential for crash reduction of the measures that we're looking at. Um, I did show you very quickly when I showed you the toolkit is that most of our tools, we want to see that crash reduction factor, that crash reduction measure. Um, and we want to be able to see if that's actually happening in the field, right? We want to make sure if that is um, really effectively helping us reach our goal. Of course, cost and timeline is a critical thing too. Um, and we look at, you know, how does that integrate with other opportunities or projects or initiatives, you know, kind of looking at um, maintenance and how maintenance can help serve uh, the greater good. Um, and so what we'll talk about a lot now is you know, these, these different levels of measures of when we deploy things. So signage and marking projects, again, when I say low-hanging fruit, that's typically what I'm talking about, right? Because uh, you can do a lot with signage and marking often. Um, the nice thing about it is, relatively speaking, it's not that expensive. So you don't necessarily have to have a prioritization. It's like, oh, we can only do these uh, signage and marking projects. Um, and, and again, we're calling it tactical work because sometimes it, it, it goes beyond just the signage and marking as it goes to putting in these flexible posts, uh, putting in other things in the street that help uh, just provide a little bit more separation and definition between the different modes. But again, usually pretty inexpensive, so not something that we necessarily have to prioritize. Um, Sometimes, though, we do uh, ensure we, we are opportunistic in, you know, kind of making these changes along with our uh, maintenance programs, like repaving and things like that. Uh, policy and regulations. Again, policies are things that we have to evaluate and make sure are helping achieve those goals, too. Not something that you see out in the street, but necessarily because you see over time. And so I talk about, I've talked about one of those important policies that we've um, 
felt was important for our Vision Zero program, which is looking at speed, right? Are our speed limits set at the right speed or not? Um, other policies are, you know, how do we, um, for instance, like, you know, where do we put the lead pedestrian interval? Is it something that we do um, after analysis only, or do we just say that there are certain areas where we're going to do that, right? And we kind of chose, in some cases, we'll do it on a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases, we'll just say, you know, if there's enough issues on this corridor, there's enough people, there's enough people walking, there's enough people biking, so we're going to put LPI on this whole corridor, right? So that's the kind of decision that, or policies that we will make. Um, other policies, when we talk about uh, systemic, right? What are the, the low-hanging fruit? What are the types of things we can do and deploy broadly? Um, something that uh, was a, a really a big interest in the community was every stop sign we have marking a stop line, right? So now we have that as a system-wide initiative. Every stop sign has a stop line with it or a stop bar, sometimes it's called that. Um, so, you know, again, we're looking at how policies can support um, our, our uh, goals. Pilot projects um, is another way we implement things, and I will talk about that in more detail. Um, those are things, though, that we're just testing things out, right? Is this going to work or not? You know, rather than, you know, kind of just asking a theoretical question, we're actually trying to test it out and see what happens. So the one, the projects that um, we have to prioritize more, because they are more substantive in terms of change and cost and staff time investment, right? are what we are called these quick build projects and these capital projects. So the way that I will distinguish that for our discussion today is that a quick build project is something that is basically something you see in the toolbox, right? Something we know is a tool and it can be done within, let's say, um, a year. Sometimes it takes a little bit more than a year, but that time frame. A capital project is a little bit bigger Again, making some sort of physical change, a quick build often makes a physical change, but it can be done very quickly because it's small and scale. Uh, a capital project is, again, something that is put in concrete, something that is being constructed, but um, takes more time because it's more extensive. So, uh, okay. and so that once that work is done, again, the important point that I want to make here is that for these tools, we continue to evaluate that performance after implementation because we want to make sure it is doing the, the job that we wanted it to do, right? Because again, if we're going to reach zero, we have to evaluate things that we're doing to make sure we're on the right track. So it's this loop. We're actually, you know, in this loop where we're continually evaluating and looking at things. If, if you find like one area shows this problem and there's another uh, similar area in town that has the same setup but there hasn't been problems there yet, can you fix them both or would you just be one that has the data with the problem? So that is what that systemic mm -hmm. deployment is that I was describing. If you find a problem in one area, right? see a similar area but doesn't have necessarily the crash history, uh -huh. how we try to address that is through these low cost measures, right? Doing the quick signing and marking projects and sometimes tactical work where you know, it's less expensive, it's easier for us to deploy, um, so we don't have to necessarily prioritize because it's not a capital investment, right? So we're putting up signs and markings because we see that there's an area that is similar to an area where we have a crash. So we're doing the same thing, right? So we do that with the signs and markings. Sometimes the tactical work too, which I'll describe. So that is something that is an important thing to keep in mind. Now the limitation is, 
is when you're talking about the systemic safety and deploying things in areas where you don't see crashes but are similar to an area that does have a crash, um, again, the investment, level of investment error for making those locations is that sign and marking and tactical work. It, we're not doing, you know, if we see that, you know, perhaps there's like some sort of major constructions needed and a hot spot. We're not doing that at all similar locations because of the size of the, and the scale of that. So again, the separation is really critical here. Tactic, these things in this box up here, everything in that, we can do uh, very easily, very wide scale, and see how it works and how it fits into future, maybe, quick build projects or capital projects. And I'm gonna give you some examples that help explain that. But again, the only thing that we can really do on a systemic level, that is looking at if you have a crash in a location and there's similar locations that don't have crashes yet, the really only level we can do there, in the, in the, realistically, is that first box up here, this first highlighted area, signage and marking projects with tactical. And that's why so much of what we do is really important in this tactical area. And I'll get into this a little bit more. So, <clears throat> tools are delivered as projects, big or small, but they can all have safe, significant safety benefits. And the thing to remember, too, is you know, because you are um, putting in a bump out, right? A bump out, you're narrowing that crossing for a pedestrian, benefit to a pedestrian. Slower speeds for vehicles, too, right? So benefit from vehicle-vehicle conflict, benefit from vehicle-bicycle uh, conflict. The benefits are usually across multiple modes. That's the important thing. Um, some involve combinations of tools. Some tools um, you know, we put in combination because they work well together. Um, and some are temporary and some are permanent. And we'll talk about those right now. Oops, Bob Ross popped up too fast. Um, so tactical projects, again, th this is really important. You can see in this picture what we mean by tactical projects. Uh, includes signage, markings, uh, flexible posts, and that's, get this working here, that's these posts right here, these white posts. The intention of that, <clears throat> you can see here, this is like a bump out, okay, where I'm tracing. Um, and these posts are areas you don't want vehicles driving, so there's less exposure for a pedestrian crossing, right? You're making the vehicle make a much sharper turn rather than a wider turn, so they're going slower. So you're reducing not only the uh, chance of a conflict, because there's less area where a pedestrian's in conflict, but if there is a conflict, the vehicle's going slower, right? So it's a multiple benefit, right? Uh, but this is what we talk about when we say tactical. Um, <clears throat> cost is low and funded through, um, again, looking for opportunities through repaving. When you're remarking, you can do these bump outs, right? You can put in the tactical bump outs while you're doing the markings. <clears throat> it can be implemented in less than a year. Community, the engagement is typically low because, again, we know it's in the toolbox, right? This bump out. Is already in our toolbox, so we know that if somebody asks, like, why are you doing this? It's like, well, this is one of our tools we're using to improve safety because it does these things. It reduces vehicle turning speeds and reduces conflicts with pedestrians. <clears throat> and then the real benefit of these is it gives us that chance to experiment, right? It gives us a chance to tweak because just because we're putting this out on the street right there. Just because we're putting it on the street like that doesn't mean we can't modify it. Because we do modify it. We look at what works. We look at what works better. Um, and then so eventually these things could be built out. But again, going back to like the benefit of deploying things like this in that short term is that we can do it in a lot of places. It doesn't always jump to this level of quick build project or capital project, but it can. But it can. And the benefit is still realized when you're doing that tactical project. So, Bob Ross, everybody, anybody a fan of him? No, yeah, okay. So, what can you do by paying the street? That's what Bob asked, right? 
So here's an example of, of one intersection that uh, we just saw a lot of conflicts. There's actually a little context here. There, this is a trail on this um, roadway back here. Um, so there's people who are crossing from the trail to connect to other network of trails. So it's really highly used by pedestrians and bicyclists, right? So tactical design is transforming this auto-oriented street into something where you're repurposing that space for other modes. So you see what happened here? What happened? Took a lane away. Took, a lane away. Yeah, took out a left turn lane. As we saw, like, you know, operationally, we can serve this movement with one left turn lane. So just block that out. So this is the tactical part, right? You can do something tactical and make and see that benefit right away. See that benefit right away. And then over time, right, through this phased approach, you're looking at, okay, well, we can make it even better, right? We can put in these planners to kind of just make that space, you know, more protected from um, intrusion by, by, you know, somebody that you don't want to be there. See, you get enough rain back there that those plants will grow if you did that out here. <laughs> well, cacti. I, so I have to tell you a secret. We have a lot of planters where there's dead plants, okay? <laughs> this, this wasn't always like that. But, you know, again, to that point, is if you want to keep it, you know, working and lively, then we will work, we have a business improvement districts. We'll say, look, you guys take your water truck around and water them how many times a day? Here it might be three times a day, right? You, you water it as much as you need to. But again, all these things are done in partnership, right? all done in partnership. So there you go. Ultimately, the long-term goal is to improve this trail crossing. And again, this is a sign we typically use for our trails because you see bikes and pets, right? Um, but it's a much better crossing, right? You eliminate that lane. You have a wider crossing here. This is actually a raised crossing, right? So that you're getting people to slow down. And you can't see this here, but See that? That's a device, a detection device, right? And those are little dots around there. They flash, right? They flash when somebody is detected in crossing. Um, so again, you know, you can transform something like this into this over time. But by doing that tactical design, like you see right here, you start to see benefits immediately. So you have striped crossings. Yes. Crossings. Is that, have you always had those? Or? You mean this type of crossing style right here? Yes. Uh, yes. Yep. You've always had them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We, yeah. we don't have those for the most part. So this is something that is one of those, um, you know, proactive systemic things, right? Is we use this, what we call high visibility crossing, right? We use this style of crossing, um, any uncontrolled crossing, and uh, four ways, almost all conditions. I don't want to <laughs> label them all to you, but we use that mostly and rarely just the two stripe lines. Yep, we rarely use that. Do you think it's more eye catching? Do you think? Yes, that's why we use it. Yep. And again, this is something you need to build into your program because the cost difference between this and just two lines is thousands of dollars, right? And so we didn't do this instantly. We did it over time. We said like, first all uncontrolled crossings are gonna have this style of, of marking. And then we said, um, uh, then all way stops will have that style of marking. We said anything within 600 feet of a school. So again, we just expanded and expanded. So at this point, it's rare that you see a two line crosswalk style in, in Arlington. So it takes time. Um, tactical design allows you to see if things actually work in the street, right? Um, so if you do, engineers have these tools to see if, um, you know, if you can fit larger vehicles through an area, right? And sometimes that'll tell you like you can't, right? But you can sometimes just test it out and see if it fits, 
right? If you want to see if you can narrow down that roadway to help facilitate crossings a little bit better. So again, you can test things out. If it doesn't work, you can take it out quite easily. Again, achieving success is one of the things that we had uh, spoken about is you know, being opportunistic through this, this process, right? Um, finding opportunities through routine maintenance, meaning like when you're repaving, just restripe the street so that it fits better with the safety needs and the modes that you're trying to accommodate. Um, in this location here, you can see a really wide intersection. Um, but these are just tactical bump outs on every corner, on every part of that intersection. This is the original, but this is what was ended up with. And I should have brought more pictures that I think about it because most of those are built out now where, again, the street just looks really, really different. It takes time, but again, you see that realization, that benefit, uh, almost instantly when you do the tactical work. Um, consider the long-term design, right? It's like, you want to look at, if you're doing something tactical, what is the ideal kind of infrastructure there, right? You want to make sure that you're not doing something that would go against that, but is kind of integrating with that. Um, and again, this is a case where you just had this really difficult crossing for people because it was four lanes and there was no refuge. Um, and we're even signage. So we put up uh, you know, some of the tactical bump outs, this median right here that help people cross in two stages, meaning like you could you know, go and look at traffic coming from one direction and then go to that little refuge and look for traffic in the other direction. So it helped you cross in two stages. Um, and then we started building it out um, on, on the median in the corners. And again, just always trying to, to build things out, but looking at the long-term design. And in this case, when I say long-term design, you know, ultimately what we want to see there is a signal, right? So we want to make sure that those bump outs are providing space for signal poles, for the cabinets, for all the things that kind of go along with them. Uh, engaging effectively. We all have kind of identified that engaging is with the community is, is really critical. Uh, we understand that. Uh, we want to engage effectively in many ways. So here's a couple of ways that we engage so the community understands what the intent is. Right on the left, you see this is a, a 3D model of a protected bike lane. Right, so right here, try to trace without shaking, but you have your bicycle lane is running curbside. It's separated by, uh, from the through lanes by a parking lane. So, you know, in general, bicyclists are better protected but what we mentioned earlier, right, was where are bicyclists vulnerable when you have a protected um, bike lane? At the intersections, right? So, you know, we develop these uh, bump outs with, you know, putting in the bollards, uh, the, the flex posts. I'm sorry, in Arlington they actually call them bollards. I don't know why, but <clears throat> I wasn't able to change people from saying bollards because to me a bollard is like something you hit and, yeah, it's fixed. Um, but the flex posts, so you define what that turning radius is. Um, you make that conflict less severe because they're making a tighter turn, right? So again, you put in all those elements. You show people what a protected bike lane is. You show them how they're supposed to drive when they're approaching a protected bike lane, right? Because it's different, right? You have to look for people walking. You have to look for people biking, and then you can pull up to where you can see you enter the roadway. So it requires more of an effort from the vehicle standpoint, but we want to make sure that motorists understand that, right? They just don't drive out and think it's clear for everybody. To expect people, expect people driving, expect people biking, expect people walking. So when we do the engagement, uh, that is, you know, on how the proper use is, and also on 
what they can expect to see and how they can navigate it as a user. Um, also achieving success is that iterative implementation. Like I said, when we go out and put something in the field, we have the opportunity to see, like, does it work? If not, then we can actually take it out. If it does, and maybe we make it better. In this case, you see we put in this protected uh, bike lane. Um, we saw, you know what, we could actually make this much better um, because we didn't need, um, you know, that was still a pretty wide turn. So we made that turn much sharper um, and better protection and actually could fit in uh, like bike share capital or our bike share station in there too. So there's some other benefits too to help promote that multimodalism. Uh, here's an example of kind of that next, what we're, what we're saying is this next generation of tactical things because we talked about the bollards. The thing is, is we put the bollards in, we have to maintain them. What I have people do to, for me is they will bring in bollards that are sometimes knocked over, and they'll put it in front of my doorway in my office, right? <laughs> so it's a reminder that, yes, we've got to maintain it, but we're also looking for more efficient ways of putting things in, and sometimes they're more costly. But this is a good example of something that we're looking at doing. Uh, so again, here's an example of uh, a one-way street in one of our downtown areas. Uh, this is actually Crystal City. And, you know, you can see it's a pretty empty street when these, um, you know, uh, Google images were taken. But it is quiet at times. So there's like some peak traffic. But it's pretty quiet. So we saw that there was an opportunity for what we say is a reconfiguration. So what was that reconfiguration? Um, this photo right here, you can see a two-way cycle track, right? Bikes in one direction and in the other direction. Two ways, two different directions. We took out a vehicle lane, right? Um, as you can see, it was two lanes here. Took out a vehicle lane and put in this two-way cycle track. And then here, um, where that buffer, or that separation is between the vehicles and the um, uh, bicyclists, we have these concrete barriers. So again, the bollards are sometimes difficult to maintain. But these concrete barriers have another benefit, not just being easier to maintain, but it also is easier for fire to access, right? So if fire has to access, they can, these are all, have the right, you know, PSI rating that the fire trucks can put the outriggers and everything. So again, it's something that saves us on maintenance, but provides that separation. Uh, and we do actually, in some, locations do both combinations just so where the facility starts right this is the very beginning it's just to reinforce that you know this is a separated bicycle facility vehicles on that side bicyclists on that side right so we do do some combinations and again key thing green markings mean what bikes and the conflict areas uh, this is actually a driveway so, um, just a little bit showing that you, know, you can do different combinations and things that enhance the work you do on the roadway. So did you make this, the street on the left, is that a one-way street now instead of a two-way street, but it's two ways on the bicycles? Yes, it was always one way. It was oh, two okay, lanes, it was two lanes one way. Okay, we took away one of those lanes, so it's now one lane mostly. Okay. And, and it's, you know, with, with our streets, we don't have a real grid system, so we'll have streets that are like two lanes for a block and then they're one lane for a block. You know, we have a little bit of a uh, <laughs> mix, mix of, of different things. Um, but you can see here, this is one lane, and then, uh, you know, the, the parking is still there, but it's farther out, and um, we have room for that cycle track. The, the one thing that's important to note is like when you do move parking away, right? for a protected bike lane because your parking isn't against the curb anymore, you're moving it further out in the street, is that what we have to do is typically remove some parking spaces so you maintain that site distance, right? So that's one of the trade-offs, if you will. 
Do you get a lot of snow there? Well, we used to. We haven't gotten snow for a while. We didn't get snow last year. Well, we um, mentioned the fire uh, emergency can get over a certain thing. I was wondering about snow plowing. Yeah, so we, what we do with all of our devices um, as part of that kind of collaborative effort, um, like this, I mentioned earlier, the effort to put in new tactical speed humps. We um, you know, work with fire, emergency, let them ride over it. We'll put them in a place to pilot to see how it works. We'll take our snow plows and see what happens with that. I got some pretty cool videos on my phone of us <laughs> testing out some things. But we just see what, what the expectation is. Um, for our speed humps that are tactical in certain things, we're thinking of uh, putting up some labels or some sort of indicator that is not a signage that would be confusing to folks. It would just be something that the, um, the operators would know. So, for example, when we have a speed hump, right, on, we always mark them with a warning sign, you know, a diamond, yellow diamond warning sign that said speed hump, so they know that they're supposed to slow down. Um, for the operators, sometimes we'll put like a little um, like red square or a sign or something so that they understand that they're supposed to do some sort of action, right? Well, we, we also have uh, street cleaners that come through now and then yep. to get like, the oil and the wine off. Yep. Uh, they come by maybe once a year. How do they get through all this stuff? So we have specially designed vehicles that are narrow, that are about 10 feet, that can fit through these areas. And so, you know, when we do snow operations, we, we do our primary roadways first, but we do have a trailer that will take this little device out and it'll go out and sweep all of our protected facilities. So we do do that. And it takes more time because it is just one thing. Um, we do have some areas that we have like a pickup that can fit through some areas and you know still experimenting with how where the pickup can go versus the specially designed uh, piece of equipment so um, again you know from the maintenance standpoint we're, we're kind of lucky in the way that with when it deals with snow we didn't get any last year but every other year we've gotten snow and you know we train the operators sometimes these things get knocked down which is why um, you know we like the idea of putting in these concrete barriers is a little more sturdy. Um, but we do, uh, you know, we do spot checks of our flex posts, but we do a spring kind of just drive through. We load up trucks and, you know, just go through and see whatever's down and we put back um, uh, our flex posts and we'll do it in the fall too. Um, but then we do it kind of sporadically. And again, we have this reporter problem tool where we have a pretty active bicycle community. And again, they'll tell us if, if one of these flex posts, if one flex post is down, they will tell us. And I always get flex posts put on my front door too. So <laughs> I find out you know, where they came from and we'll send out crews to, to address that issue. Um, so again, um, you know, I want to get, we're running out of time here, but I want to emphasize a few things um, that I had talked about earlier on the importance of when you deploy something, making sure it's functioning and working, right? So here's some charts and graphs and some um, uh, tools that um, we've deployed. This right here uh, is, I'm circling that, tools implemented travel lane signs and markings, and basically uh, it was a T intersection uh, where there was a lot of crashes, so we put an advisory speed, watch for turning vehicles, some other warnings too, to just really call attention to that there's this location that there were crashes that we were trying to solve. So after we deployed these signs and markings again, before 58 crashes, six crashes in the after period. Different time scale a little bit, but again, when we compare it, on an annual basis, much, much improved. So we like it. So this is something we can continue to use. But again, always have to monitor. Uh, here's another uh, situation. So again, 
uh, tool implemented here, stop sign control. This is an always stop. And again, you see, using MUTCD standards. So using the MUTCD, MUTCD standards, this qualified for an always stop. So we put in the always stop. The before period saw 13 crashes, two in the after. And in this case, you know, the before period was just you know, three years. The after was five years. Huge improvement. So it's effective, right? But again, we have to monitor. And when we do things like this, right? When we do these analyses, right? We can see if it's, here we go, this is like, I just did a quick uh, poll of what we've done in the past um, few years. 24 always stop installs, um, before period 53 crashes, six after. Again, when you kind of level that on a uh, equivalent time scale, average went way, way down. But again, by looking at these things, if this works and we see, or if we look at something like this and we see it's not working, like, whoa, how come the always stop's not working here? Like we had here, we do an additional measure. Like here, we put in stop on the pavement, right? Just to reinforce and emphasize that this is an always stop condition. All approaches stop. Uh, so again, the reason you monitor is to make sure you're aiming in the right direction. Right? Otherwise, you'll never get to that zero. <clears throat> Another before after. Uh, so this, like, this is an interesting condition. Again, this is a T, uh, and I know it's kind of hard to visualize, but we did a couple tools here. Roadway reconfiguration and separated bicycle facilities. But what was happening here was uh, sight distance issues were a big problem for people coming off that T. Um, so we just basically put in this protected bicycle lane, and it really opened up those sight lines. Really opened up those sight lines. Uh, before crashes, 36 after. Again, we're monitoring things. Before after. This is just a lot of space. This roadway was 30 feet wide, entering uh, a merge into another roadway that was four lanes. We don't have too many of those, fortunately. Um, but it was not so good. Um, but again, this is something that we just marked up a lot in the before and after, you know, the, the benefit is, is that this after period is longer, but this is something we got to monitor and probably do a little bit more. So again, we look at this because it tells us how is it performing? What else do we need to do? We did talk about chicanes, I think pretty good, right? Um, but the chicane here that you see is this is a tactical thing. This is, we went out to the community, the community didn't like the idea. We said, let us test it after much deliberation. You know, we got through to the point where we could test it. Um, but again, it's just signs and markings, the center line here, the parking lane here, and bollards. And you don't see the bollards in this picture, but we did put in bollards to help those transitions from side to side, or sorry, flex posts, falling into Arlington habits, <laughs> the flex posts. Um, but again, in the end, the, the nice story is that people saw this, they said like, you know what, this really does work, right? People are going slower. Um, and so then you can put in more harder skate materials now that you've proven that it works. So here's a couple of questions on projects. You see any issues here? Because not, I'll have to say, not always are issues evident. You see any issues at this location? It's a mid-block crossing. Well, you don't have any safety lights. You mean like flashing beacons? Yeah. That's true, we don't. <laughs> and, and I will say, we reserve our flashing beacons primarily for four-lane roadways. Um, we, in the past, um, and I will probably talk a little bit more, in the past five years, we probably put in 30. So we had three, and now we have like 36. So well, we are using them, but more limited case. What they've done in Caldwell is, instead of having the overhead lights, they just have a big post there with two lights on it or something like that. I've seen that too. Yeah. We, we don't do that, but I've seen that. Well, it cuts the cost considerably. 
do the parking spaces go all the way up to the crosswalk? Ooh, wow. So they don't, but people were parking in anyway. There's a hydrant, so we had to block that out. And we had to block out this other side too, because this is a bike lane, but people were parking in the block bike lane. But if you don't go out there and look and observe what's happening, you don't know that. So good call. So we you can't see here off the page. We striped it out and put in some uh, flex posts here and flex posts there because people are parking here. And we actually put in these yield lines as well, just to reinforce. But yes, when you go out and look how people are behaving, you kind of figure out sometimes you got to do more. Quick build. Again, we I did talk about this a little bit. The quick builds are projects that could be implemented in a relatively short time. Uh, I think before I said about a year. This says one to three years, which is probably more the reality. But again, the whole intent is for something to get done on that shorter time scale so that you make improvements, right? Tip, cost is typically low. What you see here in this uh, image of one of our quick builds is basically bumping out all the corners and putting in a, a median refuge for pedestrians to cross, right? So when you bump it all out, you shorten those crossing distances, right? You um, make vehicles drive slower. And again, the beauty is you can start this work with the temporary materials. You don't have to wait until you go into construction. You put in the temporary materials, the flex posts, and you even have the ability to change that in the field to see if you can make it better. You can make it, um, you know, if you can enhance the safety. So uh, here's some examples of some quick build projects. So this is a flashing beacon. So we do do these flashing beacons on two lane roadways and schools, okay? Um, but in this other case, not typical because we just have so many crossings. And so we're trying to figure out what is the, the right priority. But around schools, we do do that. Um, uh, and an enhanced crossing, an enhanced experience for kids. You know, parents, uh, people driving down the street, they want to not hit people, right? So if you provide more information, it's helpful. Uh, here's another quick build safety project. This is very similar to what we've said a few times. Just taking a really wide intersection like this. This is a neighborhood street, believe it or not. I think it was like almost 36 feet wide, pretty wide street. Um, did have on-street parking, which takes up some space, but not enough. Um, and so what we did is just bump it out. You can see this wide street right here becomes a much more narrow street. RFBs, again, this multi-lane crossing where you have two lanes. The problem is with these completely uncontrolled crossings is you can have one vehicle come up and then stop right at the crosswalk for a pedestrian, but then the other car that's in the next lane doesn't know what's going on, right? So what we do is you put those yield lines in advance so that you're encouraging the vehicles to yield here to heads. Right, so they yield here. Um, and then by law, if somebody is passing at this location, they're not supposed to pass a vehicle that stopped in advance of a crosswalk in this condition. Right, so um, better. But then the other enhancement is people have that button they push and then it flashes and notifies the motorists that to expect Here's a good case too. Um, you can kind of see here what, um, if you're a vehicle approaching here, right, back on this, you're pretty far back in that intersection, right? So there was a lot of sight distance issues with people coming off here. But the other thing too is, you know, you, we didn't have a crossing over here. This crossing is what we noted is that kind of standard crosswalk style. It didn't have a, a refuge. So there's like uh, a lot of different modal um, issues, right? So there was pedestrian issues. Um, there was not continuous bike lanes through here. Uh, there was poor sight systems for vehicles. So we bring that cross, we, we bring the intersection tighter, bring it closer, build these medians out so there's refuge for all the pedestrians. Um, we mark all the crosswalks with this high visibility crossing. We put the bike lanes 
through this intersection. You know, we mark it as a, a visit buffer bike lane and put in the signage you can see as well. And these vehicles now, when they pull up to this stop line, have much better sight distance because they're pulling further into the intersection. And all the modes are more clearly defined. Question? Yeah, what are those little uh, rectangles next to the bikes? Uh, that is the buffer. It looks weird when it's just a couple squares, but if you see, if you imagine that being stretched the whole length of the block, it's just a striped out hatching in the buffer. But it does look a little unusual right here. It does. Well, it's just a few, but it's you know again, it's just a buffer space, nothing more. Sometimes we'll put uh, the flex post in there too, just so that people understand what that is. The striping for the bikes, I guess, through the intersection, shouldn't those be green? Like, showing that they're going across the, their lane? Yes. So we haven't done green always. This is a few years ago. Okay. We would probably do it if we did this project today. We would put it in green. You guys are really quick on these things, right? I need to bring you over to Arlington to kind of, like, <laughs> critique things. But yes, we would, now if we did it, we'd do it in green. It's a good catch. Good catch. Questions? All right, here's another, this might be harder to see, but this is a, a two-lane, one-way roadway. Uh, there's a crossing here. Uh, this is the yield line in advance of the crossing. And this is a uh, protected bike lane that comes right here. You can see the green there. See, we do have green. There's the green. But um, it is actually a kind of wide turn. So do you see any issues? I might have just told you a little bit. So you did have a, the, the issues are you have a wide turn uh, and the bike lane is really close to the vehicle in this maneuver. You're actually pushing them together, right? This uh, protected bike lane was a retrofit, right? So sometimes you get in what you can, but we realize that that's a condition we don't want to put the bikes and the vehicles together, right? So what we did is, in the, is basically made an island right here. So the pedestrian crossing is much shorter, right? It's just these two lanes. And then the bicyclists are separated from the vehicles by this island right here. And the vehicles are forced to make a harder right turn and slow down. And there's a little bit of space between the, the vehicle and um, the bicyclists. So again, you start somewhere, right? You did, we did this through repaving. And then we're like, OK, let's go back and do some construction to help. Pilots, um, we pilot to basically see um, what is what, what we can potentially do. Pilots could range from very short to very long, um, and we involve the community. And through that process, we figure out, you know, is it something that we keep, or we don't, or we enhance? We talked about this a little bit. This is actually a pilot where we took out an entire lane of travel for this this whole length of this roadway here and this is a school right there so uh, we did that there was a lot of enhancements but ultimately we took it out because all these roadways coming out right of this neighborhood is really hard for people to find a gap um, in traffic and we were starting to see some safety issues we saw operational issues at the school um, right here with people, parents picking up and dropping off and blocking the entire lane. So we saw some things that weren't working, so piloted it. It was worth piloting always because you find out information, but we didn't do it. Um, this is pretty uh, straightforward. This is actually a weird T intersection. We put in this temporary roundabout, right? Just with marking and, um, and the ball or uh, the, the flex posts. Um, and we collected data, some pretty robust data. So the speeds, this is the oranges before. You know, you had speeds that were uh, 35 and nearly 35. After we put in the uh, pilot uh, roundabout, we see speeds going down uh, you know, to almost 10 miles an hour, in some cases like 15 miles an hour. So huge speed reduction. Again, in our minds, speed reduction 
usually means safer because risk is less um, when you have a crash. So it looks like you had already had some pretty large angles coming into that Y. Yes. So you didn't have to add any paint, do any side work at pavement to make room for your roundabout. You just cut it down to one lane. So it looks like two lanes. So it, it was one lane. It's just it really, okay. yeah. It's just this is these are kind of parking lanes. This is really wide. And it was this is infrastructure from you know, probably 40 years ago. It's just a really wide intersection. So it had parking and stuff. So we necked it down. This is in design for a capital project. So it will be a permanent roundabout where it'll function hopefully much better than we're seeing even now. So it was a fairly inexpensive little test then. Yep. Yep, it was just the markings and bollards, so you know, a few thousand dollars. Um, right here is, we had a double left. Basically, we took out the double left, so we have the flex post here. This is a through lane. The double left was across a, a pedestrian phase, which was, you know, again, that multiple threat condition I talked about with the RFB. Um, but on a turn, so even worse, tested it, uh, and you can see that there's, this is the before period, this is the after, where there's just much fewer crashes. But again, these are the things we look at. So this is the last thing, and we're wrapped up. Capital safety projects, the bigger projects, right? So we talked about the different levels. You have the systemic. You can do a lot of the systemic work with the signs and markings and the, and the flex posts. You can then do the quick builds, um, those things that happen in you know one or two years. And then you can do these capital projects. And this is just a, a trail project that took a lot of planning effort. This is on the state roadway system. And again, coordination, these are longer term things, but also necessary as part of that effort. Uh, we had three intersections that we enhanced through that. But the big thing that was, was done is so you had this side path Obviously, conflicts at the intersections, right? Um, what we did was working with the, the state, reduce the state roadway from three lanes to two lanes, right? And that extra space is buffer and wider um, uh, trail. And the results are that you can see here, and this is not working. Before collisions, 29, 10 and after, we monitor, make sure that the project goals are being effective and addressing safety. And that's it. So we race towards the end, but any final questions? So Thoughts? how many accidents do you typically have in 2019 compared to 2023? Oh, in, in that specific case there? Since you've been implementing, well, with your, your, your whole vision for, for your city, um, how, how much reduction have you seen just in the last five years? So we've been seeing steady reduction every year except for this year. So this year has been up a little bit slightly, basically back to maybe two years ago. Um, and one of the things I think, you know, we were, Hunter and Amy and I were talking before, one of the things that we've seen is all of our fatalities this year have involved alcohol. So, you know, some of the points is, you know, that is like one of the huge efforts is really trying to get um, more effort in just people understanding the effects of things. Um, but again, we're, we've seen an overall downward trend. So we're trying to figure out right now what the difference is this year other than the alcohol. There's other things we can do. Not cell phones? Yeah, it's hard to track though, right? It's very hard to track. So if you have a lot of people that come and go into Arlington, you keep track of how many people are local people or how many people are coming that <laughs> don't know what all those signs mean. <laughs> we we do. We we do on a kind of higher level scale. You know, we don't have um, we can only report zip code information, so we know basically zip code origin, zip the zip code destination. Um, and so we're able to track things from that way in terms of like how, what other outreach we have to do. Obviously there's like one-offs from people that are, 
you know, well, out of state. Some of the configurations that you, that you showed seem to be so non common mm -hmm. that a place of things I encountered. Yeah. I was just wondering how many people get in there and don't really know what all the things. So, most of our projects, this is the thing, most of our projects where we've done something, we see an improvement. And if we don't, we're doing more, right? So most of the examples I'm showing you are areas that are improving. And if we're not seeing improvement, we're doing additional things. Yeah, I see that they're improving. It's just that if I were a non-native driver in that area, I would have some. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is something that is going to, we have to do more. I would cause accidents because I'm not familiar with this, <laughs> is what I'm saying. But that is a struggle, and that is something that we have to recognize we have to continually do more is that outreach. And again, this is why those relationships we have with different um, you know, uh, government agencies and even agencies outside, like the advocates, with you know, some of the commissions and committees that help uh, support our mission, it's really important for us to, to work with them very, very closely so that you know, okay. it's a team the, effort. The map you showed at the beginning, you guys are like a pretty high Out here in Idaho, we have like a lot of cities and then rural stuff all around. And how would how, how do those kind of work? The only thing I know how to do is go 55 on a two lane road. Like yeah, and, and we do have areas like that, you know, like our state roadways. And this is why it's important, you know, to, to partner with them to figure out, you know, how do we transform the street so that it's Intuitive the way people should be driving intuitive. rather than you know regulating everything right yeah. but intuitive you know what are the intuitive signs that people need to see that they should be looking at things differently when they're entering a certain area yeah there's yeah. different types of risks yeah. different type of risk on a rural road than well, I know, but I was looking at the, the yield of the water. We have cows on our road. I painted on the street, and I thought, I don't know what that means. And it's going to slow down, because you're like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. <laughs> and the diamond, your, your diamond's on the street that say, don't go yes. until yeah. it's clear. We have lights that flash, and if they're flashing, you have to stop, and let's say, no, when they're solid, you have to stop, and when they flash, then you can stop and go. Right, the pedestrian hybrid beacon? Yeah. What was yeah. that? The hybrid beacon, pedestrian hybrid beacon. It flashes red, flashes yellow. Yeah. No, it doesn't go yellow. No, these are just these are just for like crosswalks. Um, the RFBs. Yeah. The rectangular rapid flashing beacons. It's like a yellow police light. No, those are solid and then it's kind of a slow flash. Yeah, we, we also have the pedestrian, like it, right. we have the yeah, three, we have the three phases yeah. and yeah. it'll come Well, I don't red. remember the yellow, and I'm talking about just for crossings like um, at bus stops and stuff like that, that where they cross in the middle of some place, that it's not, not just a, um, there's no yellow involved, there's no green involved, it's just, it's, if it's flashing red, if it's solid red, you're supposed to stop and wait, and if it's flashing red, then you stop and look and go, and if it's not on at all, then you just go. Yeah, that's what we call a pedestrian hybrid beacon. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not in. I'm not in roads. I'm actually a retired electrician. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. Okay. Last question, Paul. <laughs> well, when you get started in all this, did you look at the sociological data to help explain your strategy to the? powers of the money that people are worth money. You know, if, you, if somebody dies, you've affected the sociological impact of the business of that community. And if you look at that, and I don't know how many fatalities you had on the beginning, but we, is that know, part of your sales pitch sort of on this? Is it's not so much internally, because you know, through the process of developing and adopting a plan, you know, we were able to convince people that safety is number one. So we've kind of already, you know, established that. But like when you s apply for grant funding, very often you have to do that, you know, for like a highway safety improvement program grant fund or other things, is you do have to say like, you know, what is the, what is the cost 
of somebody, you know, being injured, right? What's, you know, and it's hard to really put a cost to it, but it's, I know it's a tool that's designed to help um, promote action. And that's why it's, I think, done in that way. Um, because it shows that, you know, to do nothing is not uh, necessarily the, the right option. Okay. Thank you. All right.